Join us as we come together as a group to investigate our deepest truth. This isn't a set of principles or rules or doctrine. This is a living truth that we all have access to if we're willing to turn inward, become open, vulnerable, for willing to question our most deeply held beliefs. What is this all about? What is suffering? Who are you? Where did you come from? Where are you going? What was your face before your parents were born? What is the nature of mind? What is the nature of thought? What is the nature of emotion? And what is it that's not any of these? And yet, shining forth radiantly in your experience right now. Join us as we plumb the depths of experience, as we investigate beliefs. This is your opportunity to stand in the fire of truth, discernment, inquiry, and see what is revealed. Thank you for uh, joining. This is the third installment of Double Barrel Non-Duality, where we have a Q&A session with myself and someone else who also answers questions. And uh, in this case, it is, drum roll, it is Violet from Violet Synergy. And um, she, you probably most all have heard of her or know her work but she was kind enough to join us and answer questions for us. She also has um, a YouTube channel. And um, what is your um, website? What's the URL of your website if people want to find you? You're, I think okay. you're still... Can you, you hear me? Because I don't know about this mic. Is it good? Yeah. No. Uh, website is... See the percentages? Website's violet-synergy.com. Violet? I think it's a dash. The one, the one that's in the middle of the words, not at the bottom of the words. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a dash. That's a dash. Okay. okay. Violet-synergy.com. Hello, everyone. So, okay. Kathy. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me? I can. Good. Okay. Hello from Australia. Um, so my question is about seeing into reactivity and recently I've been kind of doing some practices but just getting some insight around primary sensations where, you know, they can feel kind of quite icky and without looking clearly at them, it feels like that ickiness then causes me to feel angry or to say something or to you know to have this level of reactivity but being able to slow that down a bit and look at what's going on and I've heard you talk about this that you I kind of discover there's really no link between those sensations and anything else you know I can't find them causing even the thought of an angry thought or you know an angry reaction or I can kind of feel that there's a bit of a push or pull away like not really wanting it somehow that sense of no and then I know and I can't remember Angela whether you've talked about this or not or whether it's from another kind of teacher um, but the more you see that in a way you more you you get a chance to kind of break reactivity so it sort of drops away and I can see that in instances but then it still keeps kind of coming up. It still keeps happening that I, you know, get irritable with my partner or whatever else. <clears throat> and I'm just wondering, do you think you need to just see that truth over and over, that there is no link between those sensations and anything else? And does it drop away if that happens? Does it stop? Or maybe it doesn't? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So just to be very specific about the mechanics of this, the um, what you're describing um, for anyone watching, uh, anyone can find this and see this, but the the way to lead yourself into it is to, in, as you described that ick, ickiness or that um, un discomfort, the raw discomfort or the um, squirminess, it feels like, really feels like mm -hmm. a, a sort of restlessness, but, but it has an emotional personal tone to it at first, especially. If you follow that down, you'll get to the place where you you can clearly recognize that there is something there that's just sensations. There's mm -hmm. something that it's a conglomeration often, like something in the chest and the head and maybe in the jaw, or you'll just feel that there's these sensations and you can clearly see that really that's all that's actually there. And, it, and then somehow it turns, it, oh, and there can be something that seems intrinsic to the sensations that is like very subtly dis I, I dislike it or or I, I find it pleasant or unpleasant or neutral that's how buddhism would say it that's one of those three things um and then the next thing that seems to happen is that we have we start to formulate a reaction to it and the reaction can take many different shapes but the most mm -hmm. overt is like outward you know uh irritability or anger or uh or complete distraction like distracting ourselves completely with an activity or a dynamic a relationship dynamic or an addiction or whatever but even more subtly we can just feel something in there that just wants it to not be there that genuinely says no this should not be this way that person shouldn't be that way that event or situation shouldn't be that way and and there's something around that that's like a belief there's a, a sense to that that feels like that's where it feels personal like no i'm sure of that that's that's where the artificiality of it begins. So just mechanically speaking, so there there it's quite possible to have just the physical raw experiences, and uh, with with a with some aspect of it's enjoyable or not enjoyable, with no need at all to do anything about it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And what you described is um, a result of going there frequently enough and actively actually looking to see if there's any reaction mechanism there. Um, what happens is the reaction mechanism softens considerably. It, it, it can dramatically reduce to the point where reactions are very infrequent um, uh, and tend to be much more minor. If we do react, it's, it often stays internal. We don't actually externalize it. We don't act out on it on, against somebody else, but we can feel it there. We can still feel something and it may go away quicker. Uh, and then there's a, there is another level to it where it can actually just subside to where the, there's like, it's like the, it's like the, the association itself is just completely, the, it's just cut. It's like gone. And that's a different experience in the sense that um, you, you can see the conditions that should cause a reaction. You can see them and you know, they're there, but there's no, there's just no reaction. Um, and there can there can be uh, still energetic restlessness there, mm. but there's no actual reaction to it anymore. Um, and I think from what the way you described it very clearly, I think you're really close to that. And I would just keep doing what you're doing. And the last part of your question is a really important one for anyone listening, and that is, um, do you know? You, you already know the answer to this, but I just want to point this out for anyone else. It's not a matter of going down and looking and convincing yourself that there's just, there's nothing that can react. Just seeing it isn't, isn't the same thing as breaking it. So mm. to see it is one thing, but to see it again and again and again, until it just completely subsides, that it's just absurd to react to anything. It's completely useless. It does nothing at all ever. And it's not even a real thing. There's not really any one doing it. There's no actual mechanism doing it. Um, to have that severed is a different thing. So you do often have to return to it and, and do the same sort of work where you're just kind of looking around and life helps you with this. Life will, life is very nice. It will put you in situations to find these deep triggers that, that you may not experience very often at all because you're just not put into those situations. So things like jealousy or th a threat to your health or, um, mm -hmm you know, I don't know, losing validation in some big way, some a public humiliation or some those kinds of things that don't just happen all the time, but they can happen on occasion where, oh, this is an opportunity to really go deep into there and see if there's still a trigger in there or still a, a trigger turning into a reaction formation. So is that helpful? Yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it gets, you probably already know this as well. 
but anyone for anyone listening, this gets it turns from something that feels extremely uncomfortable to do to something that becomes essentially pleasant or very it becomes interesting and sort of fascinating but if you stay there long enough it's not so um excruciatingly uncomfortable and and so i just want people to know that like if you spend time doing this it doesn't doesn't stay that feeling of like you're on fire like you just need to get out of this moment somehow (laughs) yeah and it kind of went like that for a couple of days recently where it was like the reactions were almost just biological as I moved around my day. Mm. And so, you know, I can't say there's anything different about the sensations, like you're saying, that it wasn't like, oh, suddenly this horrible experience became a lovely sensation. The sensations were just there, but they just came and went. Mm. And it was a level of okayness that I've probably never really experienced before. Yeah, And then it stopped. (laughs) <laughs> well, as, I was going to say that sometimes that just goes on and you don't, you don't even know until you're tested again, mm-hmm. but, um, but I, you might be surprised it's not far off until it just actually stops functioning, mm-hmm. but you know, now what it's like, that it's like, oh, there's really no reason at any level to react in the way we react. It seems like it, it seems it like self-justifies itself. Once you're in the reaction, it makes sense. It's, it's almost like now the world looks like something I have to react to, but it's, it's not at all Mm -hmm. there's there's no actual function of that and who knows where it comes from i mean we learn it we we it gets reinforced by other people that we interact with all the time and and so forth but there's there's no necessary um it doesn't have to be there it's not it's not it doesn't it's just unnecessary Mm. thank you you're welcome i don't know if violet has anything to add i just jumped on that one first yeah. Hi, Kathy. Um, hold on. Let's see. I'm looking at Angela here, so that's not really helpful. Um, oh, if you're talking, see, if you're talking, it'll it'll record you talking, but you may not see your own face. No, but I I'm looking at you, so I'm giving you what my answer versus Kathy. I if I speak, Kathy. can you see me? There now? she is. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay, that's helpful. Um, so what what kind of I like what Angelo said, and I guess kind of just a different way of wording it or looking at it. Um, what came up for me was maybe like subtle expectations. Like one part of your question maybe was something about a relational quality with someone, right? So maybe there's some subtle like inherent um, expectations and beliefs we have about that person or how they should interact around you or how I should be around them, how this situation should be that are like not conscious because there's there's sort of like the framework of this relational quality with someone right so maybe there's some of that and and with that you can sort of use inquiry like what am i not seeing about this or what is my inherent belief about this what do i really want from this person what am i not getting what I want myself to be doing, like what are my expectations? And I think even just journaling around that is it could be really helpful. Um, yeah, and and the other thing that I, I love to recommend because this was so helpful for me, there was so much time where I was just in like, I felt weird, I was suffering, I was in the mud, so to speak, and I didn't know what was the cause or what, what was I really feeling. So for me, what, what question inquiry wise was really helpful that I just, kind of played out whenever I was like, okay, something is not right, was what am I not, what am I not seeing about this? What am I overlooking? What am I not wanting to see? What do I not want to admit? Those type of questions, in my experience, have been really powerful to then sort of like life, it's like an earnest way of asking something and life's like, okay, you're ready to see the the truth that you might not like, let me show you. And then it shows you in some it might even be a, a, a argument with someone way. And then you could see, oh, wow. Like I couldn't see before, but I really wanted them to do blah, blah, blah or something, or I wanted myself, you know what I mean? Like, so maybe play around with that kind of stuff in there when it's feeling sort of vague. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That sounds like a good way to get some of those beliefs into the light, really. Yeah. Yeah, because they're really like framework beliefs, you know, they're inherent beliefs. They've been there so long that they're just sort of like part of the structure of the uh, reactive self. They're not necessarily gross or obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Thank you for your questions. Uh, so we'll go to our nod next. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, we, we discussed uh, in the last meeting and you gave me some advice. Uh, which I followed, and uh, now I have. Uh, I am trying to put you in full screen. Yeah, and I, and I have now two uh, new uh, questions for you. Uh, if you could help me to un 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 understand the, uh, what happened this past week, so so just that you understand the context. So I have I've been uh, basically uh, uh, con continuing what I was doing with the same level of intensity since I am in vacation. Since last week, I have had a, a very interesting week, uh, let's say, with a huge shift in emotions. So I, I guess you will know what I'm speaking about. I, I have been practically crying practically uh, every day. It starts uh, in the day. I have a huge wave of either sadness or grief, mostly those two. And I don't know exactly sadness for what or grief for what, but I cry for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, very in intensely, so something not typical uh, for, for me uh, at all. Then just after that, it's 15 minutes of laughter, uh, ah, laying down, holding my ribs, laughing like, like something extremely funny happened, and I still don't know why, but that is, of course, much more pleasurable. And usually it's tears, laughter, and then, what I would call the baseline unbound consciousness effect that I have been seeing for the past, let's say, two months, but which was not that strong. It's after the laughter, it's like it's clarified much more. So like, like this background effect that I have had for two or three months of this is not really physical, it increased a lot during those, those episodes. And it gets very much like the spontaneous one we discussed last time that, that happened. Uh, not to that level, but close. So this has been going practically every day of the week. So I am, I am assuming this is the process because I, at first I was wondering, I am looping in cycle because it's always tears, laughter, and same, same things the next day, the next day, but I feel more and more like relieved. So I think that it's not cycling. So this is not my question, but two strange things happen. One just lasted for a few seconds. The, on my, uh, I was doing a visual field inquiry when I tried to spread my consciousness over the whole field, including the uh, sides. And this, this time worked very well, but my whole field of view wrapped in a kind of 360 effect where the in front of me was perfectly normal, but I saw kind of, of, of the perspective distortion all around. The only re reference I have seen from that is a video from a guy named Frank Young on YouTube, I guess you have heard of it. He, he kind of exaggerated the effect a lot, but there are kind of this, the boundary of my field of view was seen as effectively warped, which I, I think is, I mean, if I, uh, I have been doing some 3D image synthesis on computer, and if you do not applic apply perspective correction, it practically the same effect. So my first question was, is this effect something that stabilizes at some point? And is it something that usually comes with a specific stage, like unbound consciousness or not? When you ask me to stabilize unbound consciousness, does that mean that this would stabilize? That would be my first question. And the second one was is yesterday evening had a much more uh, impactful. There's the same grief open, but this time I let myself completely go and I felt literally strengths of my personality, history, like, dislike, I felt all of us, like it was strands of fiber that were doing that and let myself go more and more and it, it felt kind of like dying, kind of, but I was okay with that until I felt my emotion and my feelings starting to have the same kind of 
not that they were disappearing, but like um, being loosened from my core, let's say, and at that point when I feel my emotion and my love for the people that I love starting to work, I panicked immediately and went back. But this process gave me a strange feeling that if I go there again, it's look like, it looks like, I don't know, a kind of a one-way street. I, I, hadn't go, I had this kind of feeling saying go, but it's not a two-way street. So my, this is my second question for you. If this door open again, is it a kind of a one-way door? Um, I guess it's what, what is on the other side. I mean, it doesn't look like on the other side, it was simply a kind of nice observer effect. It looked like something deeper, but I don't know where I was uh, practically falling into. So those are my two questions for you. I, I guess you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer first uh, this time as well, just because um, we talked last week. Um, and but Violet will probably have stuff to say about this as well. Um, first of all, the grief thing and the loss is it's a huge part of this process. Like, uh, um, you know, ultimately we're we are grieving the loss of something that never was, but the illusion was bu quite binding. The illusion of separation, the illusion of separate self, of of agency, all of it. it it's quite. Um, I mean, it's like a companion we've had our whole life, right? So as that goes or starts to go or comes and goes, it, there, it's just a lot of it is, is grief, sadness, loss. You feel something going. Usually with that, there's also this knowing at the same time that, that really the only thing that goes is an illusion, but it, does, it still feels that way, yeah? Um, and it, it can come in all different ways. It can come in cycles. It can come at different stages of the process. Um, it can come in huge doses. It can come in small doses. It can not be there for a while, but it's, it's definitely par for the course. Um, but I also want to say like, it, you know, there's definitely a transition here where you're starting to feel emotions in a very direct way, uh, uh, like sadness and then happiness or laughter and surprise. And, and when you start to feel emotions in a much more primary way, it's nice. I mean, it, it essentially means you're feeling it through less filtering, less mental attenuation where the mind is trying to turn it into something which usually feels like it's it's sort of deadening it out in a time span and that's how we get these like blankets of emotion tone rather than just these very pure experiences of whatever um so that that's good i think that's all positive as far as your specific questions um you know the first question uh i, I don't have a lot to say about it it's it's really just you know it's it's experiential things like that definitely happen they come and go and it's okay but there's nothing to Stay, say about it or no real label to put on it necessarily. The second, um, which is a, a deeper experience of, of really essentially, we'll just say letting go, um, that it's, it kind of lines up with the truth that we do sort of let go at two different levels. One is at the level of, of concept and the level of mind identification. And then we actually let go at, a, at the physical level, like the, and, and your experience of that is the emotion body, um, where we're letting go of form, actually, we're letting go of the physicality of being alive, even um, that if it happens in so many different ways for so many different people that I can never say there's a right or wrong to it, how it's happening for you is fine, of course. Um, I will tell you that that's not uncommon where, you know, something goes and it feels so enjoyable and expansive. And then the, even that goes or some another layer goes that surprises us how how closely identified we were with that um and it can feel like the physicality is going or the emotion or whatever but ultimately what happens is the mind interprets that in the best way it can and it'll turn it into something like like as you said like is this a one-way street or a two-way street but the mind will not understand this especially once the letting go starts to happen in the physicality there's just no way that that our, our thoughts can put together something that's going to actually make sense with what's going on. So it'll just put its own version together and say, is that true? Is it not true? It can wrestle with it all at once, but it's not going to know. The truth of it is that there's just an unbinding happening and an unbinding does happen from the actual form, from physical form. Uh, and when that happens, it's a it's a more visceral, different type of experience, more deep. Um, it, can it can cause a fear trigger that is a different kind of fear trigger than the way the mind 
the the letting go of the mind does. So that's another fear barrier for sure. But this one's it's a little different. It's it's not the kind of thing you can talk yourself out of. It's just a physical response. Um, and like I always say, it might be there. This this sort of thing could happen to you again in the same way, and it might be there and it might not. Sometimes it's just it's there and then it's not there, and and something just clicks and and you know how to let go in a different way. So um, everything you've said to me sounds fine. It does. It does. None of it sounds like anything that concerns me. But but you also don't need a. Um, you don't really need to summarize it in any way, and and you don't need to confirm it with me because it's it's perfectly okay. It's it's very much how this goes, um, but it's your personal version of it, and it's a little different for everyone. Um, I say just keep doing what you're doing and and staying mostly staying open and vulnerable to the emotional experiences that you're going through. Um, that's that's spiritual maturity to me, and and that allows things to play out naturally. Uh, instead of fighting the process, you don't sound like you're fighting the process. So that's good. I, I try not to, and I could add that I, I don't want to make it uh, overly d d dramatic because a, a part of it is very painful, but there is also a kind of feeling deep, deep below that, as you said, that this is okay, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's very strange because yesterday I, I was feeling practically like I was physically dying for 15 minutes and three hours later telling to my wife, uh, I am waiting for it to come again, which I would not have as an expectation if three hours ago someone had a, had a gun on my head. I mean, so clearly a part of me doesn't really think it's dying. It, it's, a part of me says, yes, we have to run away from it, but no, there is a different part that says, no, no, stay, stay calm. Yeah. yeah. Go with it. Yeah, you're you're attuned you're attuned to your deep deep instinct, the instinct that goes beyond any identification. You're attuned to that, and that's great. But I think I needed your encouragement, so thank you. You're welcome, Violet. I I'm, I would think might have some stuff to say as well. Yeah. Okay. So hi. Um, a couple Hello. things came. Okay. Wait. I'm gonna let him talk so it can go to him. No, I, I was just saying, hello. Perfect. Hi. Um, a couple things came up for me, uh, just feeling in, energetically when you're speaking and sharing. Um, uh, the first one is it's okay to orient to your heart. And what does your heart want? I think that would be a very valuable orientation for you. Um, and um, the, the other one that just came up too with your with your response to Angela was the um, with the physical dying like I you said I feel like I was physically dying for 15 minutes and I don't I don't want to discredit that uh, experience because I definitely relate to that but I think there's definitely investigation that can happen between what is my interpretation of what's happening and what is my vis visceral experience of what's happening because often, you know, you're probably feeling sensations in your body, but we're li we're often living in the interpretation of what's going on in the physical body, or we're living in between, where we're a little bit in the mind about it, and we're a little bit in the body about it. And that place, in my experience, the in between is the most unsatisfying and almost painful place, because um, it's like it's like a no, no, I can't go to my mind fully because that's way too scary. And no, I can't go to my body fully because that's way too scary. And I just feel like I'm in the middle and I can't get on the train and I can't go, you know, anywhere else. So maybe just give yourself permission to explore, maybe put your attention in the mind and see what is the reaction and explore the experience of the mental interpretation of what's going on. And then give yourself permission to fluctuate into the body more and give yourself permission to be there and explore what's going on in the body um, when that when that experience is going on. Um, the other the other the three sort of questions that came up for me um, are probably really direct, but I think if you if they resonate with you and you uh, ask them, they can be really powerful uh, and it feels like where you're at right now. Um, one is who is this all happening to? Right? Um, the other one is who is the one analyzing this? Mm -hmm. 
and who is the one moving through time? So I think those can be really, really powerful questions for you right now. Um, and like those sort of came first in my in, in my uh, uh, feeling of, of listening to you. And then after that was the sort of orienting to your heart, like it's okay to orient to your heart, right? So I think you're going to find, like I have a feeling you have this really soft, tender heart that just wants a little bit more of your attention. Yeah, yeah. And your mind is just busy because it thinks that's what's going to work here and that works, works other other places in life, right? But you you let your heart lead a little bit more in this space and, and you'll be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, good to see Thank you. Thank you to uh, both of you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. Great questions. Okay, now we are down to Maggie. Hi. Um, oh, gosh, I hope I can be cogent here. Um, <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. Take your time, yeah. It's a um, couple of things. Uh, I don't know why it uh, feels important to me. Maybe it's just an ego thing. But I would like to understand uh, in your history where, where the... Um, Zen stuff, because I, 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 and I don't know whether I have an, an incorrect um, sense of things, but, but even though you, you know, you've talked about how inquiry was so important, it was really the pivotal thing. I, I do suspect that the, what you had done with Zen beforehand had been preparatory, whether you felt it or not, or, you know, whether you see that or not. And so I'm trying to understand how much time and where did that fit into the process? I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. And then the other thing is, um, I'm just, <clears throat> um, I, I don't know if you remember me, but, but I've kind of said, like, I don't feel like I've had any of these, um, these opening experiences, you know, so, so a lot of this is is going on a lot of faith and that's been and that's been true for I mean the thing is that's been true for a lot of years and I went through something recently where it was a, um, a program that I was repeating that that I was really hopeful was going to make some shifts and I was it was like seven weeks long and I was kind of like suspending um you know, belief for a while. Like, I'm not going to try to judge whether anything is happening right. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do. And and then it got to the end of the program and things hadn't changed very much. And, and since then, I've been kind of reeling um, <clears throat> because um, it's just like, I, I need a I need a bone. Throw me a goddamn bone, you know, because um, <laughs> I'm just... I guess there's... I guess as, as Violet was talking too, I was getting a sense that's like... Maybe there's going to be quite a period of time where I don't have any really am falling. Like, you know, they say, let go, fall back. But I don't I don't feel like I have any evidence, even from when I've done that, that I land in a very good place. That's the problem. It's like there's not there's not that there's there's not that good stuff that I can go. Well, I know that's there, <laughs> you know, like I'm in touch. I'm really in touch with the tough stuff. But I am rarely in touch, in my opinion, with the good stuff, the good stuff that would feel like it would really balance it. You know, the joy. What the freak are people talking about joy? I, I don't I just not that I don't have happy moments, but it doesn't relate to joy. I don't understand. And uh, and even the heart stuff is it's kind of heartbreaking to hear that because it feels like what my heart wants so much gets farther and farther away it's like on an ice flow and i just i see it drifting farther out to sea even though i think i'm doing what i'm supposed to do <laughs> um so um yeah so i don't know which of those you want to try to respond to or I, i'm not even sure what i'm saying uh, or why I'm saying it, but it, but th this is the only place I'd have to say it <laughs> where people would understand what I'm talking about. And I really appreciate that. So I'll leave it up to your wisdom. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. I'll, again, I'll answer first just because you asked me a direct question. Um, the Zen thing is easy to answer because I didn't do any Zen before awakening at all. So I, I figured out the inquiry, but reading a book about Zen, 
but it wasn't it wasn't a topical thing. I mean, I had learned about Buddhism, I had learned about Hinduism, I had learned about various things, and I was interested in all of that kind of stuff, like Eastern thought. I liked the flavor of it, but I really didn't know why. And it was when I read Three Pillars of Zen, I read the actual Enlightenment accounts. They were talking about what it's like to go through Kensho in one of the chapters in that book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it to everyone. So that, that somehow that plus a lot of suffering and a situational experience in my life, that's what triggered me to figure out the inquiry thing. Um, but I didn't do Zen practice until af way after that. So um, so if that helps you to realize like, it's not that Zen did it uh, or Zen practice or austere Zen practice or doing sashins is what caused the awakening for me. But more importantly, I, and I really mean this, I, not now, but later, sit with, why do you want to know that answer, that question? Like what, it, because it doesn't, it's not just, just general interest. Sometimes it is, but that's not what this is. There's something in you that's looking for the recipe, but you can't find it in me. And, and it relates to this, so another thing you said later. And you said, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't want you to do what you feel like you're supposed to be doing. Because what you're supposed to be doing is what you're collecting from other people. This is such an intimate process. The, 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 the inquiry, it's so intimate. In a sense, you have to let go of what everyone else is doing. You really do. Like all of the Zen masters out there, all the people, all the, you, they can't really help you. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Because it go, it also it also has personal implications, but people can't help you. Even with awakening, you have to go there yourself, and you have to go inward, and you have to let go, let go, let go. And there's and it's so simple, but it's because it, it's simple because it's not a process, and and that's where I want to point you. And I think you're, it, oh, and and I want to say one other thing, and then I'll turn it over to Violet. When you got to the frustration point, and you uh, describing the frustration. I feel it. I feel your frustration, but I want to tell you, it's like, that is the best thing that's in you right now. That's what's driving you to keep taking one more step past what you can do, um, past your effort, past your knowledge, past your belief about what others have shown you about how they wake up. Their stories will never help you. You can't understand their story. You can't, I can't understand their story. I just know it because I've been through it. But when other, someone else talks about an awakening and all that stuff, the storyline of it, the way it happened, the way they describe it, it doesn't matter much. It's not really about that. And, and you can't get it from that, but you can but you can get it from you. You can go into yourself that in such a deep way that it's beyond the, the even the name you learned for yourself. It's been there the whole your whole life waiting for you to turn to it. It's like a flower. Like it just you just want to just hold that flower. It's something so simple. Um, but I think you're in a really, really good place, although I know it doesn't feel good. It feels disorienting. I know that. I know that. But it, it's a good place to be when it comes to this process. And it's not about finding the right technique. I promise you that. I promise you. Okay. It's not about like the right teacher or technique or something like that. It's it's more intimate. So that's all I have to say for the moment. I want you to stay in touch though, for sure. And let us know how everything's going. But I bet Violet will have some stuff for you too. Is she still there? I think she's still there. it's not going to help if you can't hear me. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> I said, hey, Maggie, if you don't mind responding just so I could see you on my screen. There we go. Does that help? There you go. There you are. Nice. Um, yeah, so beautiful. What Angela said is, is really how I would say it. Uh, to add to it, I would say there isn't a doorway. There, there isn't a specific doorway that everyone opens. There's only your doorway. The only doorway you can open is your doorway. And that, that's what Angela is really saying there. And if your doorway is when you go in, there's bad stuff, that's your door. Don't discredit it. The, the, bad, the bad is really a good doorway. Um, to wait and look for a good doorway, it's not gonna, it's a waste of your time. Um, Yeah, so my advice is go through go go through the bad. Go to the bottom of it. And I know that's not that's not the advice we want to hear. But the only way out is in. Yeah, I know. I just don't know how. I mean, I don't So, I don't, I don't know how. I don't feel like I haven't been doing that. That's the problem. You know, I feel like I have been doing that. 
Um, and uh, but I guess I guess I guess I need it goes it needs to go farther. It's a little frightening because <laughs> I'm old enough where it's like there. Yeah. You no, know, I've known other people who were on this path. They died before they got there. You know, and it's like oh man, I, that's not going to be a fun way to leave. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. You know, that's a big incentive. It's I don't want to be on my deathbed going, damn it all. You know, why didn't I ever get it? Um, so so that, the fear that, that that brings you, that's the place. That's the tender yeah. place, right? That's the fear that we don't want to face. We'd rather awaken to not face that fear, but to awaken is to go through that fear, go through it. It's like you're, you're doing it, but you're probably sort of going around it a little bit just in the sense of these other positive or happy or joyful beliefs that it should be this way or I got to find the right way just just like Angela said just trust your way in fully when it's like when you trust your way in 99 percent it doesn't work as well as when you trust your way in 100 percent so and that might be how do I trust myself 100 percent with this that might be your inquiry question in right how do I, how do I find my own way with, with this? And that might not be something that you're going to be able to write down or, uh, or say with words, but that's sort of like, it's, it's like a prayer. Um, I love prayer for this part because it's like surrender. It's like, I've done all that I think I can do. Please show me the way that's, that's the right way for me. Right, but that's an internal question. It's not looking for an external. Yeah, 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 keep in touch. Yeah, and I just want to say one more thing about this to you. Um, well, one, one is that I did an interview with a woman named Catherine. If you can find that interview, watch that if you haven't yeah. yet. She, she's very much like where you were, where she was when we talked initially before her shift was very much where you are. And the one of the sticky points for her was you can't, when it comes to this, this thing we're talking about, this step or backward step, um, you could almost look at it like this. Okay. Maybe I can, maybe I can wake up and, and go completely into the mystery, or maybe I can wake up and, but still kind of know how it's going to go and like, get it, get it the way I want it. Okay. There's a and B here's the deal. There's no B. It mm -hmm. literally does not exist. You have to let go of that. You have to let go of that. You're going to ever know how this goes, that you're going to get anything out of it at all. That, that can, it may or may not be your sticking point, mm -hmm. but it can definitely be a sticking point where something in us still just wants to, you know, that's why you want a recipe. Sometimes I want to, I want to know how to do it because I want to know if I do it the way that person did it, I'll get what they got. But all of that, all of it is just a, it's a play of the mind. It's not, it's just not how this is. And, it, and it's really good news that, that, because if it was like that, it would just be more illusion of control, more mental BS. This is, it's too real to be mental BS. It's too close to you, to you, not me, you. So consider that possibility as well that, you know, you just you see that like you, you can't have it the way you want. And if you could have it the way you want, that would just be more suffering because that's the cause of the suffering in the first place. The insistence that we keep putting this overlay over life and saying, but it should be how I want it to be. But should it? There's this great thing I heard once that when God wants to punish you, he answers your prayers or gives yeah. you what you pray for, things like that. So seeing that at one level, we are our worst enemy when it comes to, especially this specifically we're talking about, it's too vast to understand. Your mind can never get this, but it is your true nature. So that may or may not be helpful to add, but, but again, I think you're, you're coming to a really good place. And, and the prayer aspect is really important as well, as she, as she said. Um, and the prayer goes like that, where it's, I want the truth. I want, I, I can't, I don't know what I can do anymore, but I am willing to go through whatever I have to go through. Even if it's painful, confusing or painful in a way I can't predict, I still want to go through that because I, because I want to, I want to, give myself to this. That's that kind of prayer is a powerful prayer. So um don't say it unless you mean it, but you, say it. <laughs> you sound like you sound like you mean it. <laughs> yeah. Um I think I've mentioned before that I've done some ayahuasca stuff and it didn't 
it didn't do it didn't do anything that I wanted um and I thought when I would go into it that I would be willing to do anything but once I was in the during the night you know it'd be like oh god I would really like to avoid that or that you know so I guess I I, I don't know how much of that had to do with me or not but um yeah I'm just seeing that um <laughs> it's like I have it's like yeah you have to I have to let I have to let nothing nothing can be my refuge yes yeah exactly That's basically it I mean even like but you got something I read the the pillars thing and I just remember these people kept saying I hope it's okay that I'm, I'm commenting still um sure. they kept saying um you know, and and I would uh, I went into this session and my teacher said, work very hard. And they go and I worked very hard and, you know, and I was working very hard and that's going, what are they doing? That's the working so hard. There's never any explanation. But any, but that's just one of my frustrations with that. So it's kind of like um, the thing, the things that the re part of the reason I'm doing this is because I feel like certain things are not working out in my life. They're not a refuge. and. Um, and I'm kind of, it's, it's, I thought it was getting better and it's not, it's getting worse. And like, this was going to cure me enough that that wouldn't be as much of an issue. Either I wouldn't need it or I would be better in those situations. But basically, I can't depend on any of it. Yeah. You, you that's, you, you're right. You're right there. Just see, see what you just said watch this back and see how important that's so important this isn't here to give you something because if it if it was if it was here to give you what you think you want then that would just cause more suffering right it's it's beyond that or more primary than that or closer than that but it, but it, again you're in a good place like this is how it feels when people start to things start to shift because you you've really come to the end of what you can do really and that's fine it's actually fine to be at the end of what you can do when it comes to this process yeah it's beautiful okay but i'm not going to count on that either <laughs> don't no yeah exactly yeah i'll uh, add a little bit too again yeah i mean it's really beautiful like you're seeing it so directly like i don't know i almost my inclination is to recommend right now you just go and sit with this what you feel right now like this is so powerful and so beautiful and that that I think that would be the best the best thing um the other thing that came up to me was like um maybe journal your idea on what you think is on the other side of awakening or liberation what is your idea of what that looks like because uh you know you sort of alluded to like you have friends that experience joy and and all this happy stuff but like this isn't like happiness and joy all the time like I can definitely say that I don't know maybe some people experience that way but I definitely don't um it's um it's living it's living in the unknown which the unknown includes everything it includes like feeling grief for 30 minutes when you're driving out of the blue it includes um everything um not just the good it includes the bad as well and uh um yeah. yeah, my other my other thing was like maybe try Zen, you know, maybe maybe that's something that you're curious about in the sense of like, no, I've done I did seven years of it actually. So. Okay, okay, so there you go. But yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we have uh, Yannick next. Yes. Hey, everybody. Hey. Yes. So, Hello. <laughs> it could be that I'm in New Year's Eve in 10 minutes, so oh. sorry if it, it starts getting loud. <laughs> cool. Where are, you, where, are you at, where are you at right now? In Luxembourg. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. So, I have a, a question about distraction. Um, it's already about six, seven years that I'm on the spiritual path. And um, I'm always very open-minded, and I'm I'm not not in fear to to just um, live my my feelings, just um, keep an open heart. 
But the thing which is occupying me is, um, well, it occurs to me not so, so long ago, that always when I'm really starting to feel like this, yeah, like just just being endlessly, just being very expanded and, and being there and starting to be oh, just in peace with myself, the distraction starts coming. And my distraction is, um, well, I start smoking pot. I'm not doing it really. I, I know that I have this problem. So I just, um, always try just a little bit and I have like for two or three days. And afterwards, well, my focus is gone. And then I start again, walking back and finding the peace. And so that's like, Five years now that's that is like this, and um i i it's so hard to just wrap my my head around because I'm not yeah, something in me knows I had ah oh, I felt so blissful moments, I had so 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 much love and 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 I know that it's when I'm smoking or when I'm distracting, I know that that's not, not the, the way to go and it's not the real thing. And I know where I want to go, but um, I'm losing it over and over again. And I'm missing where I miss the exit. So I'm, 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 I'm just missing the exit of just staying there and, and of just um, when this moment comes of just um, feeling feeling the impulse of, of just distraction. Um, at this moment, it's it's somehow I don't have the um, the the space or just yeah, like the space of observing and of just questioning it. So I'm just missing this part. And next part where I wake up, I'm just there and just. Yeah, gone. Yeah. Oh, okay. You want to uh, go first, Viola, or would you like me to? I can go. Um, hey, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to respond again so I can see you. Because <laughs> I can't. I see Angela on my face, so I don't want to give Angela my best advice. Uh, what should I do? There we go. Uh, how, how do I say your name? Is it Yanni? Yeah. Yeah, it's French, yeah. actually. It's Yannick. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Hi. Yeah. So, um, uh, I I have I've I've been addicted to pot. So, uh, in the club here. Um, so, for me, it started to um, through awakening process. It started to lose. I started to lose interest in it more and more. To where like. I smoked every single day when I was really young and then uh, started smoking way less even before this path, um, just from circumstances and jobs and stuff. And then I would still smoke every once in a while when even during this process. And I thought, what is it? Like, it, I don't really love the feeling that, that I feel when I'm on it anymore. Like I, I was just not resonating with it as much. So that was going on. So then I started becoming really curious. And I think this is where you are. We become really curious. You're like, okay, this isn't giving me what it was giving me at one point. So what am I doing it still? Like partly it's just habit, right? But what uh, what I found was there was subtle sort of like nuance or maybe that's not the word, um, like uninteresting, uh, say emotions going on that are easy to overlook, like boredom. Uh, nervous, anxious, unsettled, right? So I noticed that like, for me, it became, when I, when I started noticing this, I started going, okay, well, next time I get the impulse to smoke, I want to see what it is. Like, what, did, what stems it? Like, what does it come from? Am I bored? Am I anxious? Am I like, what do I feel? So I give myself, um, I give myself a moment when I feel that urge to sort of inquire. Doesn't mean I'm not going to smoke. Doesn't mean I'm not going to take the urge. I might, I might not, but I'm going to give myself five minutes to say, okay, feel like I want to smoke, but why, what am I feeling in my body right now? Am I bored? Am I just wanting to escape? For me, it was a lot of wanting to escape. Right. Um, and so it was interesting through the process of awakening, 
I wanted to escape less and less to where again, like I was major pothead in my early twenties because I, I didn't like life. I wanted to escape and it gave me good feelings that I didn't feel when I wasn't high. So then I, I started loving life so much more and more that I was like, I don't really want to escape as much, but then I would still have these urges every once in a while. And then I would just ask, okay, do I want to escape? And so I sort of made an intention to myself that if I want to escape, this was sort of, I would recommend, I mean, if you can do it this way, that's great, but I would recommend a, a, a sort of baby step here. But for me, I was like, okay, if I, my intention was like, if I want to escape, I'm going to sit in that uncomfortable wanting to escape feeling instead. And it doesn't mean that like, I can't smoke if I'm with my friends and like, I'm like, okay, I'll smoke if, if it's for fun and I don't want to escape. But if I want to smoke because I want to escape, uh, that's not okay with me. That doesn't align with my truth. So I'm just kind of make that intention. So that's what I did. And I just would sit with it. Like, what is it that I'm not wanting to feel? And it would just bring me into the emotion body that I was trying to avoid. And you can do that in the sense of like, spending five minutes, like, okay, can I sit with this restlessness for five minutes? And if I can sit with it for five minutes, after five minutes, I could still smoke if, if that's with the urge is still so strong. But you might notice after five minutes, you go, oh, okay, wait a minute, I can spend another five minutes here. And then now 10 minutes later, you're like, I don't even, I'm, I'm now cleaning the kitchen and I forgot about smoking. You know what I mean? So I would just sort of inquire in that in between when you get that urge like make the intention to sit and see what's there and also it's okay if you still smoke you know what I mean like maybe it's a hard day and you just can't bear being in the emotion body and you just need to escape and that's okay too that will it, it will change on its own time with this intention of uh, orientation to truth to living truth that it feels feels to me like you're falling in love with. So that's my answer for you. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I would I I just want to say like everything she said was what I was going to say. So I don't have much <laughs> honest. I honestly don't have much to add. Like she pretty much said what I was going to say. But I I will add a little bit, and that is first of all, I just want to broaden this to anyone listening. Like this goes for any kind of habit, including yeah. shopping, getting in an argument with somebody, getting in a debate getting online and just randomly looking at stuff online for no reason, just anything, anything that you feel and you've identified as a habit or unnecessary behavior or whatever, um, this, you can do this exact thing. And, and what she said is right on the money. Just, just say to yourself, okay, maybe I'm going to smoke pot today. I have a strong urge, but I'm, I'm going to sit here for 15 minutes with no other distractions. I'll put my phone away, not look at the computer, not do anything else. I'm just going to sit here and just feel what I have to feel. And um, yeah, what are the sensations you're feeling? What are the beliefs about what's going on? What are the emotions? In it? It's usually underpinned by emotional something. There's some some emotions in there somewhere. Um, and the only thing, other thing I would add is once you can do this for a while, maybe you can actually sit there for a half an hour or an hour before anything, before you actually take on the behavior. Um, you might want to do half of it where you're just feeling like, what are my sensations I'm feeling? What are the, what are the emotions? And then spend some time actually looking through the beliefs around it. Like you can even write them out. What are all my beliefs about this behavior right now? Well, it's to escape. Well, can I be sure of that? Maybe it isn't. Maybe there isn't. Maybe I don't even need to escape anymore. Like as Violet described, you know, you, you come to a point often where the, the habit is there maybe to avoid something, but you might realize, well, what I've been avoiding all my life, it's not even really an issue anymore, but the habit can still be there. And, and sometimes it'll fall away just by seeing that clearly. So spending some time looking at the actual beliefs surrounding the habituation of it can be helpful as well. But overall, what she said is, is really the, what I would say. And um, just open that gap up, you know, say, say to yourself, I'm not going to judge myself for doing it or not doing it, but let me spend some time in the trigger reaction area and see what's all going on here and that, and be patient. The other thing is be patient. Sometimes these things do take a while to, to slow down. Yeah. And then the other quick thing to add uh, was timer. Like I love timers for any of this stuff is like, can I sit with this for five minutes 
set a timer on your phone for five minutes. That way you have like accountability that makes it huge because otherwise then you're like, oh my God, how long have I been here? Now I'm like in this, you know, it's just confusing to keep track of just five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is. But I think like manageable baby steps is really valuable. I love the five minutes. And then, you know, five minutes becomes manageable. You can do five, uh, 10 minutes, or you can just keep adding five minute increments. That's easy. Um, but yeah, like I have, I have Alexa, uh, speakers all over the house and I just tell her to set me timers, which is probably going to want to set me one right now, <laughs> but yeah. So anytime really in any time where I'm like, okay, I need to just sit with this for a minute and, and pause, whatever it is. Um, I'm just like, okay, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, I think it makes it really, really helpful. Okay. Good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Awesome. Okay. We have Rachel next. New hey. Year's from England. Nice. Oh yeah. Um, I, I live in London, but I'm in Tennessee <laughs> right now. That's where I'm nice. from. Yeah. Um, it's really good to see you. It's really good to see you, Angelo. Um, thank you. Nice to see you. Um, I've just, um, I've gotten so much out of um, the podcast and the book and yeah. So um, I wanted to ask about something that I encounter this time of year and um, it may be helpful for others too, which is um, this impulse toward purification and um, I've noticed recently that in my kind of main spiritual practice, which has been Kundalini yoga, um, there are these lurking assumptions um, about my worthiness in this endeavor. Um, and I feel um, this must be linked also to a deep fear of helplessness. Like I can do something to help this, I can help myself prepare for enlightenment and um i i just have this fear that it's going to endlessly recur in this cycle um that that i'll never be purified enough um and that i'm kind of um stuck in a loop of sorts uh, that could be self-defeating. So um, I wonder if you have any advice for uh, not getting stuck in this loop of feeling like there's always something I can do to become more worthy, to uh, purify myself to the extent that I'm ready. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I relate to everything you're saying for sure. Uh, as we move into sort of deeper stage realization, this stuff, what you're describing becomes quite salient, um, specifically around helplessness, uh, the feeling of um, the loop, looping, rumination, uh, and so forth. Um, and I love that you're attuning to nature uh, or you have that inclination. And I feel the same way when it becomes autumn and into winter. I love the the dormant, everything's going dormant, you know, and um, I can feel it in my body as well. And uh, there's a strong tendency to go inward. Um, so so I think a lot of it's just a natural, simply a natural cycle and you're just in touch with it and and there's nothing to do about it at all it's, it's not it's not even a personal thing now there is a personal aspect of course and um the helplessness is an interesting one it really i would say at the bottom of the whole cascade of emotion at the very bottom of the emotion body um is this fear of helplessness actually um and uh the the helplessness itself or what we we would call helplessness from the standpoint of agency of a separate seeming self is um, a sort of dreadful. <laughs> That's the way the view would look at it. But helplessness itself is so um, primal and so real and so true and natural. Um, and 
from the non-perspective, from the, the non-separate perspective, uh, it is this sort of innocence. It's an innocence and a, and a, um, a total relinquishment of any movement against any natural movement, uh, any uh, resistance of any natural movement. And so it's so beautiful. It's a completely surrendered place. And, and animals are wonderful examples. You know, a dog or a cat um, or, or animals in the wild, just watching the way they move. There's absolute innocence there. Um, and uh, so we can f- take our models from nature from this uh, with this as well. Um, now, the interesting thing is the worthiness or unworthiness aspect. And I might say it this way. Um, the for me, I was able to, after many years, to look back somehow energetically and even through memory uh, and see that as soon as I became aware of myself as a self, I there was a sense of something was wrong with me. There was there was something that just didn't feel right about it. They were like actually associated, like almost the same thing, as if unworthiness and the sense of a separate self are kind of the same thing. Um, and And I really believe that's actually true. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with perceiving oneself as a separate self, or it's not a judgment or or moral thing at all. It's just an experiential thing. For me, it is. And um, the and I know and now I can see the mechanism of it. And essentially, it's the moment we perceive ourselves as separate from all that is. We there's something that feels like it's missing, and and that is going to be personified through self awareness. That's how consciousness puts this stuff together. And the looping is associated with this as well. But the thing I want to point out about the sense of being in a loop is that what you really are, what your true nature doesn't loop. There's nothing that can loop about that. The looping always occurs in consciousness. And and there's nothing wrong with consciousness either. But consciousness, again, through self-awareness, takes on that flavor of unworthiness. So for you, a lot of what I want to point to is a mechanistic thing. Um, and just seeing it really, really, really clearly, seeing where, how the sense of personality um, or personalness even arises at all. Not that you're trying to eradicate it, but just seeing clearly that it has a certain flavor and it's because of this mechanism of self-awareness functioning in consciousness, perceiving itself as somehow separate. Because And, and that ultimately it's not, that's not what you really are. It's not your true. It's not your true nature. It's not true nature. Um, that's what I'm inclined to tell you. It's, it's just a matter of clear seeing. It's not a matter of getting rid of anything. Obviously, you have a good handle on um, the importance of ener- the energetic uh, aspect of this, uh, um, and and that's great. But one thing that it gets over well, one thing that just gets overlooked, I think, until it doesn't with this whole process is belief, the power of belief. Belief is very strong, including including the really fundamental perceptual filters that make it appear as if there's a subject and an object. And that's kind of what my video today was about. Um, that doesn't feel like a thought, like a narrative belief, but it is actually re- structured in consciousness as a as a, a subtle thought. So um, so the energetic work is great and it's hugely beneficial, especially after after the realization of non-dual and no self. But um, but it's it's still easy to overlook that sometimes we have to come back to consciousness to come back to that that world of thought and belief and either passively through spending time in that unbound consciousness meditatively and so forth or through a- actively and sometimes you have to be active about this actually looking and tracing down the beliefs where does the belief in not enough arise how does it arise in this situation is there actual evidence for it in immediate experience or is it a habit is it something that's just been believed so many times that it's a reflection of a reflection of a reflection in thought, but I can't actually trace it down to any source. There's no source for it. And and sometimes you just have to see that again and again and again until, oh, okay, it just subsides. Um, the sense, the fundamental sense of being a person in consciousness can still be there and it's fine, but you see that there, it doesn't refer back to anything. There's nothing that that's based in. There's no ground of being uh, that is um, associated with that, uh, and that you could call, you could call that liberation in one sense. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's where I want to point you. I don't know if that did that sound reasonable. Did that sound? Yeah, thank you so sense? much. Definitely. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I completely, I can see that it's a perceptual thing. It's a filter. And um, what, what I'm, what I was worried about, you know, is that like this kind of impulse toward purification or, you know, whatever is driving, you know, the spiritual practice that I've had up to now. Um, I think as I'm seeing more, I can see more where like I was motivated um, negatively as if I had some defect or that I needed to like fill myself with this purity or something. Um, yeah, just needed to purify all the time. But I think also there's this, this thing of time, um, you know, also uh, factoring in where um, it could always be, I could be better so that this thing of enlightenment or something will hit me tomorrow or the next day, or like, you know, I can keep going until it comes. And, and there's this kind of linearity to it that is imagined as well. And so, I mean, and also um, would suppose that I'm not pure enough already. Right. Yeah, exactly. You, you're, you, the purity is there, period. The purity yeah. is there. It just is. And it always has been, right? And so that's the beauty of it. And realization is truly by grace. It's undeserved. Like no one can deserve it because yeah. it's just not about that. So um, so yeah, letting yourself off the hook in, in that and seeing that, okay, I'm not, it's not like a force hack. You're not like forcing enlightenment through through purification or something. Um, you don't have to deserve it. You, you know, your, your, your being is beautiful just because it is period. There's nothing, it doesn't need anything. Uh, and, and that's great. Um, and the deepening, the insight comes through a natural curiosity and fascination with, with truth, with reality, with whatever energy, um, that's it. it it's a naturally. And so, so for you, you're at this, I think you're, I don't know you, but you're, it seem like you're at this sort of stage of where it, it sort of shifts over from a personal journey to more like it, through, through effort to more like a, um, a journey of spontaneous unfolding. And you have to learn to hand that baton over to reality to unfold in its own natural way. And again, it's an yeah. attunement with nature and seeing that there's no flaw in the experience of the personal, personal aspect of it. It's not flawed, but it's just not the whole story. It's not even close yeah. to the whole story <laughs> yeah. and, and just letting yourself off the hook and seeing that. Definitely. And, and I mean, it was served to me in a way um, I had to confront physical sensation that I had never had before with no explanation. And so, um, as you've said, it, it really is a portal, but I wouldn't wish on anybody else, Yeah. but it's still, uh, I mean, it was literally, literally sensation screaming in my ear to pay attention to it that took me out of my intellect for the first time that was still the frame um, around all these practices. So yeah, there's this kind of slow easing that's quite actually a rough <laughs> easing yeah. off of that uh, uh, complex, that egoistic complex, I guess. Yeah, and that, and that can definitely, I mean, there, that definitely comes up for a lot of people in different ways. It can be a physical pain. It can be an incredibly powerful, energetic experience. Um, it, it can be a lot of things. I've been through some very interesting things that I don't necessarily talk about because it's easy to misinterpret or, and it's just not everyone's, everyone has their own path, but that, that, that's exactly it. And you're, that show, it definitely shows that maturity that you see it for what it is that, you know, you could see it as this demon, you know, essentially, or something that is just yeah. should not be, or you can see it as something that has probably been pushed away by every single being that has come in contact with for so long that you have an opportunity now and yeah. it's going to require absolute open heartedness and nothing. That's the only way in and, and absolute it's love really. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Violet may have stuff to say too. I don't have anything to add. I think you, you nailed it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for that question. And um, we are to Jordan. Hey, everyone. Um, happy New Year from the future here in Australia. Happy New um, Year. <laughs> happy New Year. 
Uh, Angelo, last time we talked about um, this kind of feeling of neutrality and sort of not so many ups and downs, and this was kind of a break from our previous like significant amounts of anxiety. Um, and uh, you said it, you said something that sort of uh, stuck with me and I ref reflected on a bit, which is um, you said that I seemed really calm. And while that's definitely true, I definitely feel a lot more calm than in the past. Um, I also know that I tend to like internalize a lot of um, like frustration, anger, like all of these kind of feelings. So I've, I've, I've gotten quite good at kind of putting this calm persona on. And um, I remember friends used to say in school that they could never imagine me getting angry. Um, and I think I've learned that like at a pretty young age that there was this kind of like shame or guilt around being angry and that I shouldn't sort of show that and not just anger but all these other things so I, I tend to like internalize them a lot and a lot of the way that comes about is like I seem it, a lot of it ends up in the jaw <laughs> I've noticed like like my jaw becomes really 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 tight and um and also the chest obviously but I guess my question is is there any kind of point in I feel like I could sit there all day kind of investigating the tension in the jaw and just look looking at it and and it, it somewhat releases but then it's like it's there again the next you know as soon as i stop investigating that so is, is there any kind of point investigating that tension directly or um should i be investigating sort of what's under it which i haven't really been able to find what's under it it just sort of seems to accumulate there but i can't sort of find the source of it um so i'm just wondering like what yeah, where should I be putting my attention there? Okay. Violet, did you want to start? Um, uh, sure. Uh okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that you say something, so please. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Thank you. Um so I think it's really valuable to look at these kind of places physically. Like when we're having physical sensations, I think they're they're doorways, they're clues to to what's really going on and can lead us to unconscious beliefs, unconscious expectations, um, unconscious energies and emotions and so forth. So it's a simple sort of recommendation that you can sort of play with and just intuit how, how it can go for you is by resting your attention in whatever sensation. So resting your attention in your jaw and then whatever is the first word or thing that comes to your mind it could be an image it could be a word but there's the the most powerful way of this type of inquiry is the things that our mind wants to say nah that's unrelated right like I once was facilitating a session like this with someone and they had like uh they had a uh, image of a, a sailboat come through when they were resting say in the jaw sensation or something it's like it's it was the, their mind wanted to say oh that's unrelated but because the sort of mechanism of this type of practice is to take anything that's there like that sailboat led us to such a beautiful discovery of what was going on unconsciously if, from that location and so a simple way of this practice is to to rest your attention in the sensation be patient because sometimes things are like i like to call shy they're repressed or uh, unconscious energies or thoughts or emotions, right? So you just stay open, rest there, trust whatever comes, and then sort of investigate it, but always keep this connection with body and mind. It's sort of the balance of the both. And then the other sort of um, uh, key to this type of inquiry is... Um, is active, uh, keep it active, right? So often sometimes something like hard will come up. You might get a memory of, of being a child and something not so pleasant or something. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, but now the memory's gone and I'm dissolving into the sounds and it feels really good, right? So there's this part of like ego that wants to co-op this type of practice and take you off into some like dissolution experience, which is really just sort of bypassing it. So the key is to keep active and work with whatever memory or image or thought came up, even if it seems unrelated, and um, try to try to like intuit, play with it with in the body and the mind, in the sense of I don't know if I'm am I making any sense here? 
Yeah, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean, like working with an image, are you sort of keeping the image in your mind and investigating it or, or like yeah, working so, with a memory? Right, right. So if there's an image, a memory or a thought, you can either ask, um, you can just sort of uh, just watch it, just sort of look at it, keep it active, keep it there. You can ask, what does this mean about me? How does this relate to my body right now? Um, is there a connection to my to the sensation in this image? Like, what is that connection? Is there something that wants right. to be explored here? Those type of questions. Um, right. Yeah, it's sort of a tricky practice, but I think if you just intuit a little bit of it, it could be really helpful. Yeah, yeah I think I think I get I, I have been kind of avoiding that in a sense because I've been thinking, oh, that's that's mind stuff, right? It's like to think about the thoughts. <laughs> But so it's kind of hard to know what the distinction is between getting lost in those thoughts and like investigating them. Totally. Yeah. And for me, the answer to that is always, if there's a sensation that you're saying, I'm always feeling this tension in my jaw to me, I, like it relates to something unconscious, which is in consciousness, right. which is in thought that can be untangled. Right. Because it's ultimately right. like when we're sort of, um, mind identified the body and mind is split like it's one mechanism it's one thing but it's split we like live in the interpretation of what's going on so we have like sensations in our chest and we live in the interpretation like that's anxiety that's because that person did that to me blah 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 right so we live here and not in the physical sensations of it so what this practice does is help relink the mind and body as one unit versus being so sort of segregated, right? Because like right. those thoughts and beliefs and expectations become so um, unconscious because they're not connected to the body. But if you're mm -hmm. having a physical, like the bot, this is the clue, right? If you're having a physical sensation tightness somewhere, that's a clue that there's something related connected to it that you can relink. If that helps. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. So it's almost okay yeah. to kind of go back and revisit old memories and go down that path as long as you're kind of staying in the body with it. Yeah, absolutely. I I I I found like a really helpful uh, unfolding in this path through that, and I work a lot right. in this sort of realm with people one on one. It's super helpful um, mm. because it's like what we are the thought-based me is a collection of beliefs, expectations, unconscious energies, and emotions. So it's beautiful that the body has access to it through the connection of the body. But I would just say like, always in this practice, keep that connection to like, when you have a memory there, I would, I would cue you to keep half of your attention on your jaw where the sensation is and mm -hmm. half of your attention in your mind. And you can kind of fluctuate between the two. You can explore like the mind part and then explore the body part, but keep mm -hmm. the connection between both, right? Because often we have a belief that, oh, we're not supposed to go into our mind too much or, oh, it's too scary to go into our body yeah. sensations too much. And again, it's the body mind split where the, the two are just sort of not one thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I hope, I really hope that's helpful. helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. I think I have been in the kind of avoiding the mind stuff thing camp too much. And yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And um uh I'm pretty busy and stuff, but if you wanna I could send you my telegram if you wanna keep in contact with the this type of practice and any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um I'll just add to what she said a little bit, and that is a valuable practice. And the concern or the question about do I go, do I venture into narratives and storyline and the past and all that? Um, I think she answered it very clearly, but it's true. And, and the, the one of the litmus tests for that is does it feel stuck? Does it feel recurrent? Does it feel like a vasana? Does it feel like there's mm -hmm. un addressed material there psychologically or emotionally or whatever that's often a clue that okay you probably should do some digging so um for instance yeah we could tell ourselves oh well there's you know i know i'm no one i know i'm just vast awareness so there's nothing to look at anywhere the problem with that is what what happens is that turns into a belief and then you use that belief to not see things 
like you don't see when you're reacting you don't see when there's on the suppressed material and and whatever so um so there there is there is a an importance especially in the first movement of realization with awakening to really see very clearly that you're not any of that and that's awakening mm-hmm. you to to see uh feel and ultimately have a shift in identity to something that is completely beyond any narrative of course that is a really important movement of realization that's the first part and without that you don't really you haven't really left the driveway but paradoxically after that you know you have to do some work and the key to that is knowing when that is is when you start to feel these these deeply rooted fixations or vasanas or you know you can just feel you start to feel what un addressed material feels like um and then it, it can be it can definitely be helpful to go in and see okay well where is this rooted and you might be surprised when you find that something that happened in your childhood is causing you to have this certain kind of reaction and that reaction causes you know a chronic tension in some part of the body um it doesn't always have to be addressed that way but it definitely can and it can be a potent way to get at things and the more something feels fixated stuck and recurrent for someone especially over years the more inclined i am to bring them into some kind of direct inquiry into beliefs into what mm-hmm. is this about where where is this rooted and without that often you can overlook it for literally ever um yeah so that, that i would agree with what she said with all that yeah i think so that's yeah i think that's where i've been <laughs> i need to investigate these beliefs yeah thank you Uh, burned, burned or burned. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Bernd. Yeah, it's a yeah. German name. I'm from Austria. Uh, I think that ties in uh, what uh, what was just discussed, but it's really subtle stuff at the moment with me. So please bear with me. I'm trying to explain it, and it actually uh, ties into your answer from uh, to Rachel. Um, I was practically since two or three years ago depressed all my life and I did a lot of therapy and I have a vivid memory from kindergarten which actually ties in and I don't know if the sense of self first came on that day or it's just the first memory I have but I ate a sandwich as a three four year old and one of my teeth broke or fell out or something and I became totally self-aware that oh no I have a teeth now in my mouth and I was totally ashamed of that and so I can it's like okay the self came online that moment with the shame it's like tied in and actually I don't know if that's true but maybe I was so ashamed that I actually swallowed the tooth but I'm I'm not sure if that's true (laughs) so what I'm doing the last days is the one meditation from your app uh what's the biggest problem and you, you say it just choose what is the most current and, and it's really that sense of self that first came online when I was three or four years old so I'm just sitting with it and trying to follow your instructions and just feel into the body and to go back and then just lands this feeling my body and then I can start to see that really what my ego or mind does is it latches on to that primarily it takes its sense of being itself from that primarily but really when I don't pay attention or when it just does what it does it launches on to everything like what I'm seeing what I'm hearing that's like it's occupying everything and I can see that I see when I'm in normal mode reality through this ego lens and then when I'm sitting for 20 30 40 minutes I can see both of it that like yeah that's what the ego just does it just grabs onto stuff and tries to occupy it and tell you that that's you and then that's and that's actually my question then um then I feel like yeah I can see that that's not me but who am I then but when I formulate the question who am I or what is move both kind of work for me then I can feel that the mind or the ego gets a lot of energy just from the question itself and then getting shot back up into that whole conglomerate of stuff so really my question is actually what I tried today or yesterday was well okay if I ask with my thoughts with my little thoughts then everything is back 
So can I ask the question from another place that isn't the thought? So just keep the intention or something. So I tried that, it kind of worked. <clears throat> so the question is, should I just for the next days or weeks or whatever, should I just sit more in that uh, where I can see that the ego just basically colors everything, what I see, hear, feel? Or how could I self and how could I do the self inquiry at this point when because when I try to self inquire it's just back in the mind and back in the ego ego I guess that's my my question if that was made sense at all yeah for sure okay let's you want to try an experiment sure okay yeah, sure. cool cool so you know when you're meditating and say like you ask what is Mu or who am I and you're just yeah. you're brought into this spacious consciousness that is kind of uh, ill descript. It doesn't have parts to it. Uh, it doesn't really have boundaries. It's it sort of has that neutrality. Yeah, you, yeah. you can easily lead yourself there. Obviously, so yeah. so so if you kind of consider just that that quality of of that that space that it's kind of indeterminate. Um, it's neutral. It's uncharged. It, it it sort of has a potential in a sense to be anything, right? Because it could be any thought but it doesn't have to be yeah. anything at all. Good, good. So yeah. now now what I want you to do is just, um, if you look at the whole entire visual field in front of you and mm -hmm. notice that we typically put our attention like right on an object, that, that most important object that we're looking at, which is someone's face or some object we're, we're reaching out to. But if you notice that, that something that's putting importance on that object is not actually in the visual field. For mm -hmm. instance, if you just take in all of the peripheral of your visual field, you see there's just as much information and it but it's but we don't call that important like we do the object we're engaging so if you just notice the texture and quality of the entire visual field at once and you mm -hmm. might notice it also has that sense uh that consciousness does where it's kind of ill descript but it it can kind of take on certain shapes and forms and so forth can you get that sense out of it so, so the the tendency from the consciousness to latch on to stuff, if I can find that in the visual field, the, the, well, more more when or, consciousness is not latching on, just that that quality. oh that openness uh, okay yeah, the openness now in the visual field though like don't don't think about this this isn't something to think about you have to you have, yeah, to, yeah. You have to look at it so I actually can, sometimes yeah sorry yeah I, so if you can see that like right now if you can experience that entire openness of the visual experience. It, it is not, it's not by accident that consciousness feels that way. It's not by accident that consciousness, when it's unbound to a thought and a sense of a thinker, it's not, it's not a mistake that it has that spaciousness that also is shared by the visual field. Um, so you can actually meditate even with your eyes open or inquire. And when you ask the question, where can I ask this from? Can I ask this from a different place? Mm -hmm. Ask it from that place. Ask mm -hmm. what am I? What am I here in the scene? Um, wh where where is evidence of I apart from anything uh, here? Where is evidence of separation at all here in this visual experience? Taking in all of it at once. You, it, it, if it's too hard in the visual field to start with, start with it in the sound field. But mm -hmm. when you start to notice a depth that goes even beyond consciousness, you're in the right place, and okay. it, you're you're wide awake with your eyes wide open. Um, uh, cool. This is starting to investigate the non-dual aspect and this, the, the, um, that which is reflected by consciousness, I'll just say it that way, that which is reflected by consciousness becomes far more compelling than anything in the mind. Um, and it has a way of answering these questions that is so not, it's just not conceptual, but it's very, very real and very alive and vivid. In Buddhism, we might call it luminous. Yeah, cool. So, so, so am I right in my suspicion that I can ask the question itself from another place? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I can ask it like, yeah, that doesn't make that sound like gibberish, but I can ask it from the visual field itself. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I mean, it doesn't really, it's not as much like you have to ask it from there, but just the, the seeing that the question itself may even be arising there. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. The curiosity, yeah, I, the fascination behind the question, all of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I have to sit with that. Yeah. Yeah. See what happens. It's an Thanks. experiment. Okay. Sorry. Violet can probably add something more concrete. Yeah, no, I love that. that was fun. Um, I would I would add 
uh, that that is your question. Can I ask this question from a different place? That mm. is your question. Um, that doesn't need an answer. And then I would also add, um, you could ask, can I ask this question without words? Yeah, yeah, that, that's what my hunch was. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if, if that's even possible. Yeah, okay. So yeah, just to I, sit I, with that question. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and I, I, I second Angelo's advice on the visual field for you because um, for me, maybe it's not this way for everyone, but for me, when my mind, when I'm sitting in meditation and my mind was busy, if I open my eyes and meditate, my actually my thoughts were quieter. And that mm -hmm. was really interesting to me. So if I, my mind was busy, I know I could open my eyes and sort of inquire without words, just by looking at things, just by being in this visual field, in this experience here, versus when I close my eyes and my mind's busy, I feel like I'm totally in this internal space. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, that, I think that's going to be really helpful for you. Yeah, that, that's interesting because for me, it was different because I start with closed eyes and Often I, I feel really peaceful and then I think about investigating the visual field. Yeah. But then the fear comes up that if I open my eyes, I will lose the peace that I have when my eyes are closed. So I try yeah. and it kind of it kind of is true, but then I test myself. Yeah, well, just try it and yeah. then see what happens. It does, yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. And that that's I think that's brilliant. Like play with that. Like whatever the fear narrative is or the fear belief is, turn it into a question. Right. And then you can also do what I'd recommended to someone earlier, the five minute thing, like, can I just meditate in the visual field without any words for five minutes? It doesn't mean you won't have any thoughts. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm still doing it. I'm just not yeah. believing the fear and open my eyes. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, have fun. Okay. Have fun with that. Yeah, the visual cool. field is the most is the, the, for me the funnest, I think. Yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay, great question. Thank you. So uh, Alyssa is next. If she's still here, Alyssa. And we also, after that, we'll have so, 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 Alyssa, you are muted. We can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, great. Um, hello, and um, lovely to meet you. Lovely to be here. Um, I haven't spoken to you before. Um, perhaps you need a little bit of background before I ask my question. Would that help? It, it's up to you how much background you want to give. Usually, I don't need too much because I really just kind of work with what's going on in the moment. But if it's something that just keeps coming up and so forth and you need some explanation, then that's totally fine, of course. Um, no, it's it's uh, something new that came up uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, lately, um, my condition has been uh, for the past few months, uh, different periods of uh, noticing reactivity, um, noticing um, grief, longing. Um, it, it's changeable. Um, but basically, um, uh, I awakened about four years ago, and my, my husband also at about the same time. And um, and and during those last four years, everything has been very uh, peaceful, <laughs> much peaceful than the five years before when we were in crisis. Actually, I think the crisis triggered the awakening. So we uh, very harmonious, very peaceful. Um, going through our separate processes in our in our different way, but but able to be very supportive of each other. And then a couple of days ago, we were uh, shocked by a sudden uprising of extreme emotion. Um, from my side, the emotion was um, anger and fear. And it was really extreme. I think that in the moment, if, I, if I'd had something in my hand, I would have thrown it uh, at him. <laughs> so, and um, so I guess 
um, before then, whenever I'd experienced some kind of emotional irritability, um, um, lack of patience or anything like that, it, the, the, reactive, the time of the reactivity is very, very short. Um, I would uh, could see an identification with the emotion for uh, minutes or sometimes just seconds before it was recognized and, and, and dissipated. Uh, with this instance, it's been more than 24 hours and I'm still with it. It feels like uh, something uh, so huge and powerful, <laughs> um, um, a huge thing that's right here and I don't know what to do with it. Um, I, when Rachel was talking about a feeling of helplessness, and uh, I, I really connected with that because I haven't felt that for a long time. Actually, not since um, the end of the crisis. Uh, extreme helplessness um, caused, the end of the crisis was a feeling of extreme helplessness. Um, um, there was no fight left. Absolute surrender, I think, uh, happened at that point and that jumped to awakening. Um, so, so yes, I, I'm, starting to ramble so any thoughts and anything uh, that come yeah, it comes to your mind would be helpful sure you want to go violet or you want me to go first um i could go i have a sh just short um um one thing that stuck out to me when you're uh, speaking it reminded me uh Adi Shanti had said this and it, it was really interesting because it sort of became one of my orientations shift in orientations um, along this path so at some point, and I heard Adya Shanti say it, he said, um, you know, when something is in our experience that we would rather not have or um, is challenging in some way, we often think of, of it in terms of like, why is this here? Why is it bothering me? How do I get rid of it? How do I do something with it? What do I do? And what's really beautiful of a shift of orientation is how do I support this? Like, what is this need of me? It's like, you've been given a precious gem, even though it's not necessarily a positive uh, thing. Uh, what does this need from me? Like not why is this here as my burden, but this is here as my gift and how do I support it? How do I understand it in that sense? And, and that's just my short answer to, to that. I'm sure Angela has more to say, but I think that shift in orientation really helps our relationship to uh, unexpected, unwanted uh, emotion, reaction, experiences. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll, second, I'll second that for sure. It's a shift in paradigm that's not just reframing the experience, but it's seeing probably more accurately into an experience and that is, from one of something that's come upon you to some to to something like this is a this is an energy deeply repressed emotions and so forth they're energies that have been around for lifetimes generations uh perhaps ancient maybe thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years in human consciousness imagine how many times the door has been closed on this energy on this kind of rage people don't want to experience that they don't want to feel it so they lock it down they push it down or they take it out on someone else completely unconsciously and it just gets transmitted along. But how many people open the door to it and really approach it with an open heart and say, you must be suffering. Like you, what, what is this about? Like, what is your, what does the world look like to you? How does it feel to be you to regard it as, as a life force, a life form. Mm -hmm. And you've been given the opportunity to open the door to it, to bring it into your consciousness. And I actually, again, this isn't to me reframing. This is, more actually how it is that the more space we open up and by the way congratulations and you're lucky that you had a four-year honeymoon period <laughs> or or that relative piece because it, it's it's reasonably uncommon a lot of people spend you know three four five six months in just this kind of bliss state or even close to a year and then the dark dark spirits come in and all that but you may have done a lot of that work ahead of time and before awakening through suffering and so forth so um, but it's not surprising to me that even four years later, you can have this sort of really intense 
aggression, aggressive anger or rage come, you know? Um, so yeah, to the degree you can just reframe this and regard it as a, as a life force that require that, that, um, that wants to be seen, heard, felt, and you've opened a tremendous amount of space in consciousness. You could say that's the first movement of awakening. When you do that, you're, what you're really doing is your, is your, is the, not, you're not doing it, but it's setting up this ability for you to have a, a much more, uh, uh, much more capacity to, to heal, uh, energies, not just your energy, but to, to, to be able to accommodate, heal, integrate these energies that have been cast out of human consciousness and repressed for eons, literally. Uh, and whether you like it or not, that's where you are. And that's, that, that, that's the value of having that expansive consciousness. You have the capacity now to hold this kind of energy and um it can be scary like what if i take it out on somebody what if it takes me over um what what the heck is going on how long will it stay how many times will it come back you can turn all that around and just say you have my permission to be here 100 you have 100 of my attention right now you it's like a, a lost child that's come to your doorway open the door everyone else shuts the door open the door let it in give it give it warmth give it love give it connection give it space give it understanding you can stay as long as you need to. You have you have my heart here. You can regard it with that kind of love, like you would a, 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 an unborn baby that ha literally can't regulate its own nervous system, so you have to hold it close. Or a child who's just confused and lost in life. They, these kinds of energies have that those qualities, um, and uh, and you can really do 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 some transformative work, not even just for you or your history, but for for people around you and people you'll come in contact with for years to come. Uh, by by regarding it with with love and respect and and um, reverence even at some point, uh, so so that's one thing you can do. The other thing is, it sounds like you and your husband have a very good uh, relational uh, a good relationship, and you can also work through this relationally to some degree, um, you know, and, and just invite him to to be part of it. You probably already have, but I mean, you know, maybe if you have to hold hands and go outside into nature and see if you can let your body like not act it out in aggression, but maybe move, like actually feel, how does the body want to move with this emotion? How does, how, do, how does this feel to me? What environment do I have to be in until I feel like I've found the environment where this, this, this energy can start to coalesce and find its, its external? Um, um, so you can explore it through movement, through um, a lot, there's a lot of different ways to go about this, uh, but relationally can be can be uh, very valuable if the person you're interacting with can understands it and they can handle that energy as well. Um, and and again, it's not about taking it out on anybody or anything like that. Um, now, the psychological component of this or the the uh, responsibility component is to just always remember that when this kind of anger comes, when rage comes through conditioning, often it comes with some degree of blame. You'll you'll be looking for the one that caused it and how and who did who's responsible and what you're going to do about it. It can be a person. It's often the person closest to you, but it can be it can be your boss. It can be work. It can be the government. It can be anything. We we like to externalize and point the finger, but realize that um, that you ha again you have the capacity to 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 work with this. You do. Uh, and um, blame is just, it's just unnecessary for you at this point, but it's important to see it, the tendency, um, and realize that even if somebody did wrong you in some way or whatever, you know, people do what they do. They they have their own unconscious things. They, ha they it's, you, you can't control what another person, who they are, what they do and how they function and so forth. Um, so letting everyone outside and everything outside be as it is when you're feeling this, um, just giving everything the permission to be what it is, in the same way you're giving this 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 um this energy the the permission to be what it is and you're giving it your attention and your heart um that's the that's a good orientation to work through this because then then you have plenty of time you know it, it's you can be patient with it and um and really start to feel into what is it what is it, how does it see the world what does it want uh, if it wants to burn down the world, why, where, where does that hurt come from? Or where does that tendency come from? You know, really just gently probing and um, not probing, but gently uh, feeling in through with understanding and acceptance, you'll, you'll just get deeper and deeper into it, uh, into the, the it's experience. And that strangely, that's what we're afraid to do often where the last thing we want to do is give ourselves to it. Um, but that's where the healing or true transformation really occurs. Uh, it's when we repress it, as you know, I'm sure when we repress things like this, 
that we end up acting out unconsciously on them at some other time. Um, and that's, that's the world of mind identification and repressed emotion. Um, you don't really live in that world now, but it still can be hard to learn to navigate this new world where it's really about embodiment and feeling fully. And, and, and that's why the, you know, motion, um, movement and those kinds of things can be helpful to even dance, like, you know, interpretive dance, things like that. Uh, I know it sounds no. <laughs> odd. I know, I know it sounds odd, but you be, you might be surprised if you just, even when there's no one looking, there's no one around and you, you like give this energy permission to move your body. And just see how it wants to move. You might be surprised. It, it can be really transformative, actually. So, just to, these are just examples, things you can try. But the, the the key is really compassion and realizing this is a life force. It's a life form, and and you know it's probably inhabited many bodies in various forms. You know Eckhart Tolle may call it pain body, um, but the the key is to regard it with love, compassion, and and trusting that it's here, um, not for a specific reason necessarily, but it, it its drives its needs are the same as any any being any living thing uh to be nourished to be accepted uh, and to be able to move naturally and so forth oh thank you so much <laughs> you're welcome i hope some of that's helpful <laughs> it absolutely does resonate i love the idea of the to personify with love the the the, the negative emotion i think that really appeals to me Mm -hmm. And also the the advice to go outside, which is very odd that I spoke to my husband about the need, how healing the power of nature is, and we don't go out enough, spend enough time in nature. Um, the fact that you talked about the dancing, uh, I saw that Sim Khalev, who we know we're in contact with, uh, I'm in Israel, um, one of her last uh, talks was exactly about that moving the body feeling the body so yes it's, it's it's it all makes sense thank you so much and and also violet thank you so much yeah you're welcome violet my, i don't know if you have anything to say about the most yeah movement. yeah uh, that's that's so beautiful um um yeah i i love dancing so i definitely second that um i also for me um, early on was a lot of um, emotion processing through painting. So our, being artistic, um, you know, if, if I was angry for me, the, the most emotion I felt or the most common emotion was sadness, but I did have some anger come through as well. So I paint, I paint reds and I have different kind of music on when I'm uh, painting, when I feel anger or when I feel sadness. Um, you know, I'm like listening to heavy metal when I'm painting with red and anger. And when I'm painting with um, sadness, I have like soft piano music on. And, and like, for me, I really believe in this, not believe, but it's just like, it works that embodiment needs to be like life is expressed through the senses, right? So if we're trying to embody something, whether it's a a belief or an emotion it's like give it as you have five senses to give it so give it as much as you can of those five senses right like mm -hmm. give it a movement that's a physicality uh let it ma manifest and it to me it integrates more into into life itself when it's expressed through more than one sense give it a voice let it speak maybe uh you know in your in the privacy of your your own room or your bathroom or something um let it say what it wants to say. And this takes some time too. You get closer with working with these type of energies as far as embodiment and expression is concerned, but you give it a voice, you let it have its narrative, right? You let it say like, nobody wanted me. And that really hurt. And that really fucking sucked. You know, you let it speak what it needs to speak um, and let it move how it wants to move. Um, uh, maybe a sound maybe it has just a sound right like a uh, uh, I'm just pissed off right like give it that like I I think the most powerful thing like it, it makes me emotional even now just just uh, sharing this with you is embodiment like em embodiment is the most precious thing because like Angela said this is life forces that absolutely deserve to be here but we're so, so conditioned that it's not okay to be here. And what's, what is magnificently beautiful is that through an awakening already and through a mature adult life that sounds like you have, you have 
so much capacity to be the mother of these energies now. And that's so beautiful, right? And it's 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 intelligent that it comes at this time, right? Like it doesn't, it didn't come at the time when you were struggling so much necessarily, maybe to some capacity, but it's really coming intensely through now because you have the safety for it physically in your life, right? You have, it sounds like a supportive partner for this part of the path um, and all of those things. And I think like, what a gift to be able to honor that which deserves to be here more than anything, but was never honored. That was conditioned to, to say no to. We were so conditioned to say no to these. And so many people, not that it's better or worse, but so many people still say no to all of these energies. And what a gift to have the, be in the position to have the safety, the maturity in our life and the heart open enough to honor them. So I'm all about embodiment and loving these energies. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So um... you're muted, Ange. Okay. Sorry about that. So coming to the end, I don't, we don't have time for guided meditation. It's almost uh, two hours, but Someone asked a question early in chat, and I don't know if they're still here. I was going to say that. Um, yeah, turning she's your here. attention towards thoughts. Discuss turning your attention towards thoughts. When I do this, it feels physical. Is this correct? Well, yeah. The way I say it is there's a kind of two steps in one sense to disidentifying from thought. Not everyone will experience this in two steps. And this is usually early on, like maybe before awakening, where we actually become aware of thoughts as such. Like to be completely mind identified, we don't even realize we're thinking. We're just identified with the thoughts. We think the world is the thoughts defining our experience. We think the world is that. And to just start to disidentify, oh my gosh, okay, that thought that says I'm suffering or I'm angry or I'm this, oh, that's a thought that says that, okay. And then there's also an emotion or a thought that says I'm a good person or a bad person, oh, okay. It's not that I am a good person I'm or I am a bad person. It's there's a thought that says that. So we're starting to disidentify from the thought. And that take, it's, you could almost say it's like a distance is, is created in one sense. Now, what I don't advocate is like create a watcher state and be so distant from thoughts that you're watching them, you know, whatever. Um, because what ultimately happens is you'll start imagining that too. Uh, so as you disidentify from thoughts, the the sort of substance of thought, consciousness itself, uh, becomes compelling. It becomes like, it, it is sort of tactile. It's a, it is a feel. And so you can kind of start to move toward thought as well. And at some point, you can even do this thing where you just sort of anticipate the next thought or you orient toward the arising of any thought. And by doing that at the right time, uh, you can actually find this sort of standstill where there's literally the, the thoughts kind of stop forming and there's just this experience of consciousness. Now you can't always force that, but at some point, sometimes it just clicks for you. Um, this is just one sort of form of inquiry. Uh, that's what I mean by move toward thought to where you, once you see that a thought is not defining anything at all, you actually become curious about the nature of thought and you can kind of move toward the forming and formation of thought. And as you get good at that, let's say, it's almost as if thoughts just don't even arise anymore because you're just oriented toward thought all the time. And then it, then the sense of being someone in thoughts, being the thinker, being the one navigating all this also just coalesces into the whole thing and it's just consciousness. And it's there's no not necessarily thinking going on at that moment, uh, but there's it's just pure consciousness, pure awareness, pure meaning it's not binding itself to thought after thought after thought. And it's this meditative kind of lovely experience, but it's also quite neutral. So that's what I mean by moving toward thought. It's like, don't push away thoughts. Don't try to disre um, to, to like dispose of thoughts, just enough to de disidentify so that you realize, okay, I'm not this thought stream, but then you can kind of start orienting toward the movement and substance of thought itself, which is consciousness, which is naturally enjoyable. So hopefully that's helpful. That's from my standpoint and, and Violet might have something to add to that. Um, not much 
chair won't rock. Um, mess it all up. Um, what I was feeling with that question um, was the physical. Find it here. Um, sorry. Um, when I do this, it feels moving to moving my attention towards thought feels physical is basically what you're saying, Yvonne. And um, is this correct? I think it's I think it's correct. I mean, when I when I move my attention towards a thought, it feels physical to me. Um, I don't know about always, but at least right now it does. It feels in me. I don't know. For me, I really work or move in such an energetic um, movement. Um, that it's just how this body mind is oriented, I guess. But so it feel it does feel physical. It feels like this energetic movement that's what a thought feels like to me so I don't know I just wanted to share that um is a part of my experience as well and that yeah it's it's normal because that's what's normal for you like normal isn't a thing or okay isn't a thing okay is is your immediate experience um so yeah I think it's uh I think it's beautiful that the thought feels physical I don't know if that resonates or, or responds in it. Uh, okay, we'll do another quick question. Sure. Kim Suri. Hello. 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 Uh, um, yeah, it is just a quick question. So it's um I keep finding myself in unfamiliar places when I'm at home or when I'm on a walk that I normally do. All of a sudden, I find myself in a space where it's, um, I don't know where I am. Everything is unfamiliar, but I've always been there. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's, it's quite hard to explain, but if I'm in the environment at home, everything is like new. I've never been there before. I've never been in that environment before. I've never been in that room before, but I'm at home. So I'm just wondering what's going on there. I'll bet Violet has something to say to this. Oh, I love it. Yeah, how fun. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this happens to me. Okay, I was just telling Angela the other day. This one road on my way to the grocery store that I go to all the time, I noticed that on that road specifically, I just drop out and I don't know where the hell I am. And all of a sudden, I'm like, where am I at? What direction am I going? What am I doing? What's happening? I have no idea. And uh, then it, when it comes back, I say, when I come back online, then I'm like, that's so weird. It happens every time on this place. So I don't know. That's sort of always been a part of my experience. I just giggle at it. I, I'm like, it's goofy. It's fun. I don't know. It feels to me like if I could say what's maybe happening, which there's no way for me to really know. Um, it's just like reality resets itself um, or the like linear time stops for a second, like the linear movement of mind. Um, I don't really know. I don't really know what happens, but it definitely, I guess if I have any advice or recommendation for it is like, just, just giggle and do a spin around, you know, <laughs> because it's just, it's, it's really miraculous that, that, I think we're a, that we're able to keep some sense in mind of linear time to begin with, because that's not what's really going on here. There isn't actually linear time here. So the fact that we're able to sort of see it that way is quite miraculous. So um, I don't know, like for me, it's been a long time that this, this just happens randomly and it doesn't, it doesn't really like a negatively affect any functioning of my life. So that's why I think I take it so lightly and have fun with it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my answer for you. Yeah, it, it's funny that um, the implications are so fascinating because as Violet oh, hold said, on. Let me say one more other thing yeah. that before I forget. Um, the really cool thing to me with it as well is that, like I said, like it doesn't really mess up any like of my linear functioning patterns 
paying bills, taking care of life in any way, though often I don't know where the hell I am or what's going on. Um, but it's like, to me, what it proves instinctually is that there's in this intelligence that doesn't need our mind to move through the world to take care of life. It doesn't need the mind version of me at all. That, that the ADHD mind version of me that's got to obsessively write notes and not forget things. It doesn't need that part of me at all to make sure everything is just fine. I have moments where I'm like, super unmotivated. I'm like, I have so much to do, but like, I just don't have any motivation in my body to do it. And I'd rather sit here and meditate or stare at the wall. And that's what's happening. And then the thoughts like seem to have this sort of worry pattern of like, well, what if it doesn't get done? But like, then all of a sudden I'm up at 4am getting everything done without a plan, without planning to get up at 4am. And that's how it sort of works. It's like life doesn't move in the way that we think it should, or in our linear pattern ways of like, I have to be up at 6 a.m. and work from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and then be done and go to sleep. And you know what I mean? Like for me, my life is very random in the way that things get accomplished or get taken care of. And uh, it's just not my doing anymore at all. And that leads to a lot of like weird confusion, staring at things. And I'm like, I don't know what I was supposed to be doing here. And then all of a sudden something gets com gets complete. So sorry to interrupt you, Ange, but I wanted to. No, it's all good. Yeah. I mean, I just, the reason I knew you'd have a good answer because this happens with Violet so frequently and I've seen it so many times. <laughs> She'll just mess like, with me. Say, the There's same nothing in my like, house. I've never been to this restaurant. There's what are you nothing talking? in my house that's familiar to me right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, house is this? Not a, um, it's not like a vacant place of mine. It's it's a very very present. Oh. Place. Everything's very still, very quiet, yeah. and it's just yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a nice term for this that Dogen uses. It's called total exertion where they like literally the this the experience of this of that movement of the hand is coming out of nowhere non arising has no background to it it has no it has no basis it's yeah. unsupported it's it, it's the entire universe appearing as this one movement and then it's just completely obliterated and so it's it, it's it's just there's no description for this but it, um it's it's seen that the the solidity and the coming from some past into the present familiarity, all of those are just mental constructs. They don't actually apply to anything or anyone. And reality looks quite different when we don't look through those filters. And it's kind of funny and it's kind of super bizarre and it's kind of surprising even when it keeps happening, it's still surprising strangely. Um, but it's also this lovely, innocent quality and this simplicity to everything as well. And um, yeah. yeah, and but it's, it's definitely par for the course. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And then I'll add, just do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around. Cause that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. <laughs> it's like, what if, what if all of this is really just about the hokey pokey? <laughs> is that how it goes? No, it goes. So, what if the hokey pokey really is what it's all about? What it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your question. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, Kim. Okay. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure uh, having you, Violet. Thank you so much for coming and uh, answering all these questions. Thank, thank you, everyone, for your wonderful mm -hmm. questions. Um, that that was two hours. That was over two hours. Can you believe it? Um, we'll do another one in the near future. I'm not sure when, but I'll announce it. Um, but probably the next event will be a live uh, through YouTube rather than a Zoom. But it will be under the announcements. Anyone who um, is wants to participate in these, or know about these, check the community tab. And anything live is at the sustaining member level or above. Um, thanks again. And we'll see you all. Well, I guess it's this year now. We're all in. No, we're not. I'm not in the new year yet. Okay. We're not in the new year. We're not in the next new year. year. Okay. I'll see y'all next, next year. But next year will be the year you're already in. So the whole time thing confuses. So them. many people are already in the new year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. International. All our European friends. It's and, the and, international hour. That's why the 3 p.m. is good for international. Yeah, right. Everyone in um, Australia and Europe is already in 2023. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Good thank to you, see everyone. Bye. See Happy New Year. Bye. 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 Bye.